So thank you for coming along. Um, as uh, Sean indicated, I'm uh, uh, working at Western Power and uh, supervise a uh, team, or try to guide, it's a bit like herding cats at times, but uh, sci uh, data scientists, some engineers, and a whole lot of data people, um, including forecasters. So what we mainly focus on is very heavy data-driven types of um, problems, business problems and decisions that um, mainly senior engineers and executive uh, senior managers need, need to make in Western Power and a lot of that revolves around safety. So as uh, anyone who, who knows Western Power would know that they, safety is always mentioned in every single corporate strategies. Um, a huge preoccupation at Western Power but I venture that every distributed utility like Western Power whether it's gas, water, um, electricity, um, doesn't really matter, um, they all have safety as a paramount um, strategic outcome. And that's because a lot of the assets, the infrastructure is actually very close to where people are and uh, there's, a, there's a high risk. So um, of course we're all striving for the ideal and the ideal is um, that nobody gets harmed by infrastructure assets. So reality, by contrast, is that there are um, occasionally people who are hurt or there's uh, close calls uh, with infrastructure that's presented a hazard at some point. Um, and artificial intelligence, machine learning, if we can harness that in the 21st century, that offers an opportunity to take level, sorry, take safety to the next level where absolutely no one um, gets hurt or there's some sort of intervention that prevents people from getting hurt uh, before it happens. So that implies a whole lot of prediction. Okay, do you have a question? Yeah, well, it's quite relevant to some things I'm doing there, but I've been trying to get quality to come in with the HSE. I'm, I'm high up in the oil industry and stuff. Right. But do you have any thoughts of why because quality will give us greater safety. I'm, I'm thinking quality will bring greater yeah. safety, but why don't business or whatever, whoever sets the standard, let quality be a factor? Um, I, th I think in general, at least in my experience in Western Power, is that quality is definitely a strong part of it. Engineers want to um, design very resilient systems that are going to stand up to just about everything. In the end, I think um, it's capped by the economics. You know, there's only so much money we have to make um, do with what we have, and the question is, is there a better way? Um, so that's a good point because yeah. five years later we lack quality, and then we have an explosion, and there's a huge cost, but they never bring it back to the decision at, at the design phase. Right. They decide to use money as a criteria. Yeah, and so it's getting close to criminal negligence and sort of thing. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so my my experience, you know, with these sorts of problems is that the feedback loop is actually really difficult. At the moment, my understanding is a lot of large organizations that have, you know, capital intensive, asset intensive industries have a problem with picking up the information in a timely manner about what hazards their assets are actually presenting. And uh, it doesn't matter how strong a system you design, at some point it could fail. And what you'd ideally like to do is get that um, right bit of information just before it does, and then in intervene. And you've got time to intervene. So that's hopefully, uh, we'll continue this discussion afterwards. But um, I should have said that one of the primary goals I have out of tonight is to actually tap into the Brains Trust of the Perth Machine Learning Group. Um, we've benefited greatly from um, doing that over the last few years and it's uh, one of the primary reasons why Western Power um, sponsors this group. So thank you for your contributions in the past and uh, I look forward to, uh, to more as, as you'll see. Um, so, key question is can AI help protect the public?
and if so, how? So the thing that attra at least attracts me to the idea of harnessing artificial intelligence is that this prospect of unrelenting vigilance. So unlike people who can get distracted, um, possibly, um, you know, this, AI is never bored, it's always alert. And uh, their key um, uh, sort of attributes, if you like, of uh, what you need to, uh, to be safe. So within Western Power, we have the culture of um, driving sa um, safety and, and the continual conversation about safety and making sure people aren't blind to the, to the risks. So AI can actually potentially help with that. Um, so for example, harnessing AI for safety, a couple of examples, robots in hazardous environments. So I've got a picture of a, a drone here um, taking photographs of um, insulators on live power lines. And you can clearly see that there's a, a rust build up around there. Um, who knows whether that aesthetically doesn't look that pleasing, but whether that presents a, a, an actionable defect is the question. And a lot of the work that uh, we try to do in Western Power is understand, um, help the asset engineers pick up on the, on the defects that they really do need to act on um, quickly and prioritise them. So another example is um, an intelligent shield that it eliminates hazards before they even manifest. So that's where the prediction angle comes in very strongly and it's going to be very strongly driven off data and data including pictures. So over the last few years we've done a whole lot of um, experiments around convolutional neural networks, deep learning networks, to try and harness the information out of these pictures, not just the SCADA data or the numeric data that we're traditionally used to using. So um, in particular, when you're worried about um, safety and asset reliability and quality and things of that nature, the problem is the better you get, the harder it becomes to find where the defects are. It's kind of self-defeating in some ways. So um, increasingly it's a search for the needle in the haystack type problem, um, which given the huge amount of compute that's now available on the cloud, um, you know, some pretty significant um, cloud vendors out there now that are making this easier and easier for us to uh, access and, um, that compute. And that means we can crunch bigger amounts of data and hopefully find the anomaly that we're looking for amongst uh, huge amounts of data that pretty much describe a normal state. So for this type of thing, <clears throat> normal is good, but that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for the, for the stuff that looks like an abnormal state. So another um, potential big um, benefit here is taking the low value, bulky work away from people. Because we can only have so many engineers, we can only have so many analysts uh, looking at data, and the data is just huge. There's no way any, any group of people could keep up with the amount of data that's being generated. In electricity, for example, SCADA system, we're generating um, every 100 milliseconds, we're generating more data. Um, we're going advanced meter infrastructure with smart meters. Um, we're getting new readings every 15 minutes. Um, there's no way you can keep up with that without um, some sort of a compute assistance. So in doing that, the basic data processing is one of the key things, but um, what I call automated um, context creation. So a lot of what we do in, in order when we're creating models is we actually try to pull different data sets together. And they could be very disparately different data sets. As you um, see from some of the examples I've put on the list of what we've been doing, each data set is you know, like a major challenge in itself, just getting access to it, understanding that, and then piecing that together. So creating that context rapidly, rather than taking weeks and months to come up to speed with um, what's going on, we actually should be able to do this in like a, an hour, hopefully. Um, Autofill fault and average forms for field crews. So I've been out in the field a couple of times, and um, field crews in West Power have two choices. They can either use the tough book, which is digital, so uh, as soon as they enter the information, it can be uploaded to um, Western Power's databases and 
they could be accessed potentially. But invariably, the, the, the data form, the actual page comes out when they're writing things because there are still a lot of um, challenges, I guess, with using tablets in the field, tough books and things, and they're not perfect. Um, so to get people off paper, because paper, as soon as you commit anything to paper, you're back into the analog um, processing, the old fashioned way of doing things, that, that's where you get stuck into just pulling in data that dribbles in over days and weeks, especially when we've had a major um, weather event of some kind, and you've got thousands of these paper forms dribbling in, and there's a huge crew of wisdom power that um, try to keep up with up updating the databases. Obviously there's a huge lag there, so um, I think part of the solution to that is going digital, but making the digital work seamlessly and making that the thing that the field crews, because they're trying to minimise the amount of time filling in forms and maximise the time actually uh, getting the, the network back in the state that it needs to be in. And so autofill might sound like something really simple, um, but if we can use the machine learning models to actually correctly pre-fill um, those, then that minimises the amount of information that field crews need to correct. So obviously there's always a level of correction that would be required. And then even with that, getting that, that correction feedback so we can update the models and because um, like I say, we're looking for anomalies and so when you find them, um, they become precious and you actually want to retrain your models uh, using more observations of that kind of anomaly. And then converting numeric data into a more consumable visual form. So um, you can look at streams of numbers if you like, but it's kind of hard to visualise what's happening. So um, I've been a great fan of uh, SAS Visual Analytics, for example, because it could um, turn that data into a visual type of information. I think it's really important. The large scale predictions at microspatial scale. So we're looking across the entire network, but also we need to be very specific about each location of that network, and that's a major challenge. So the sort of usual top-down type approach works in some use cases, but not in that many, actually. So we're actually finding, as we go across the network, it's been built over the decades, it's using different components at different times and different designs. It's very heterogeneous. It's, it's not the homogeneous electricity network um, that's the same everywhere. At some point it's poles and wires, but when you get into the details, especially when components could be the source of the failure or safety risk, um, they're wildly different. So, and our vision here is to get engineers out of spreadsheets. Because we, we want to tap into the engineers' um, subject matter expertise. We don't want to start doing low value um, basic data processing work. So some of our experiments to date, we've got a longer list than this, but so I thought these are probably the, um, uh, the more interesting ones for the cap mainly for the capability that we've kind of been developing behind the scenes. So um, one early one was uh, solar PV output estimation forecasting trial with Solcast. So Solcast grew out of the ANU. Um, they got some arena funding and we were one of the original foundation partners with, um, uh, with that project. It's now turned into a very successful um, prediction company. And what they do is they translate um, solar radiance satellite images and cloud um, images into uh, estimates of solar PV because solar PV has come on so fast that we don't uh, necessarily have as many metres as we need to actually uh, measure this directly. So most of our meters are actually uh, um, telling us what's on the net basis, whether we've exported electricity to customers or we've imported electricity from them. What we need to do is separate those two feeds. So we're seeing an unbroken feed of solar PV output, and that's uh, what the Solcast project is about. Um, so uh, moving on, once we've actually got estimates of solar PV, we work with the Perth Machine Learning Group um, to actually harness the, uh, the photographs, the images, thousands of aerial images we have because the application process was pretty complicated. Uh, people wanted to connect Sol PV um, to their home. Um, it actually created huge delays in, in um, the information we had about estimating how much electricity 
um, generated by solar PV is coming in uh, from customers, so usually during the middle of the day. So that was a major one. Um, the solar system low trial with perfect. So it's kind of like a theme here. All of these top three are related to solar PV. So it's a new technology, it's very successful. I have solar uh, panels in my home too. And um, what we're trying to do is get on top of how to manage this. So system low uh, thing, which we're very preoccupied around this time of year, is you get um, often clear blue skies, but low temperature, um, minimal um, load on the network uh, for heating. A lot of the, the load, a lot of the reasons why we sell electricity is because people are either heating or cooling their homes or the buildings. Um, so um, around springtime and autumn time, you don't get a lot of that. So the refrigeration load drops as well. Um, at the same time, we've got maximum uh, solar PV output because it's ideal conditions for generating um, electricity from solar PV systems. So it's a system load. Um, showed us, um, we focused on the Waikiki Zone substation and just showed us that we could stream this data, we could pull this together and come up with um, uh, voltage predictions um, by the hour. Um, so that was the point of that one. The pole top fire prediction model, this is um, Pete Condon, who's presented at the Perth Machine Learning Group uh, once or twice on this and the asset uh, failure models with Three Springs technology that we've uh, been doing those experiments, extending the uh, pole top fire prediction model, which is one particular safety hazard uh, in Western Power to extend that to as many others as we can. And that's concluded pretty successfully as well. In addition, in natural language processing, a field comments about asset failures. So those um, field guys filling in the tough books are giving us a lot of information um, and it re requires two or three engineers every month to go through, comb through all of those, classify um, what's happened because the field crews have been out responding to failures, asset failures, and try and enhance that information and add that to the data that we have about um, outages and things. And then vegetation inspection models. So, um, Vegetation is a major preoccupation for a, a lot of utilities. Um, we've got trees and things that grow through power lines, send crews out to actually uh, prune them back. The question is, with a <coughs> network as, as extensive as Western Powers, is which parts? Um, which parts did we do last week? Um, what can we leave to the week after, and what do we have to do this week? So, traditionally, that's required a lot of people to go out in the field and then um, bring back paper based information to tell us. Um, what we're trying to do is harness uh, satellite images from Google and others and translate that into uh, vegetation prediction models, which has turned out to be fairly challenging. Um, you need to know about rainfall and sunlight and species of plants and a whole lot of other things that uh, we're not, not expert in. And so this is what I mean about trying to pull in disparately different data sets. Um, once you start working on a problem, you realise you need some context. Um, it's not just um, a, a time series of observations from one particular asset, it's a whole combination of information that isn't necessarily being created, waiting for us to um, uh, come along and pick it up. So um, it's been a really interesting journey and um, we've got a bunch of lessons that um, we've learned along the way. So this is where, um, get your thinking caps on because this is where we need some help. So um, one of the things, I'm an economist uh, by training and uh, I think about productivity a lot. And um, I don't know if I've coined this, but productivity traps are everywhere in this, in this game. There are a lot of barriers. There's a lot of um, things. So if you think about the traditional tried and true ways that uh, utilities have managed their assets, it's about people talking to each other and getting action to happen through phone calls. And you might ring the warehouse and get them to prepare a materials pack. And you, um, you're organizing a courier or something to take the pack out to where the, the crew is. Um, when you try to go digital, all of a sudden you've got to um, drop one skill set and pick up another. And that, that new skill set is still in development. So there's a lot of things, a lot of tools that are likely to be around in five or ten years that don't seem to be around at the moment. And that means we get trapped. Obtaining and cleaning data is a huge preoccupation. I really want my, my guys and girls focus on um, developing better models. 
better predictions, and yet we stuck with everybody else down as about the lower level as you can get, and I'm just looking for the data of scrounging for it and uh, cleaning it. And feature engineering, which is another sort of additional skill that you've got to pick up, is um, very time consuming as well. The compute setup, so moving off our desktop computers or under the desk um, computer, some of them are souped up laptops or whatever. Um, we've got to get off that because it's clear that um, this problem requires massive cloud computing <coughs> and deployment. So even you can put together the best model, but if you can't get it to the people who are actually going to use those predictions and um, do it in um, a way that's efficient and easy for them to consume that information, then and you haven't got any business value. So the key question is what form of deployment will unlock the business value? Another thing we've come up against is alert fatigue. So depending on how well designed the model is and how accurate it is the prediction, you can get a lot of false positives. False positives and also false, uh, false negatives as well. Um, false positives seem to be the thing that come in large volume. So even if you've got a 99.9% .9 accurate model, the scale of um, issues that we're dealing with, that can mean in an average day you get a thousand false alerts. <laughs> um, that is highly distracting. It also creates a lot of stress because you don't know when you get all these list of alerts, which ones you need to actually take seriously and which ones you can ignore. So that's a major problem. Uh, so we need better model training methods um, that are going to help with that and automate that as much as possible. And we need a better way to filter the alerts as well. I don't have any magic um, solutions here, so looking for your help. So um, to be clear on core requirements, there's a few th basic things that we're looking for. We probably add to this list, but here's the things that uh, I think are pretty important. One of them is accurate, as I mentioned, but too many false positives. Explainable and believable. So if you are getting a lot of false positives, you need some way of a person being able to cross-check um, what the model's saying. And if, if we can't explain what's gone in the model and how it's actually generating the predictions, then it's pretty challenging. So a lot of the deep learning type models and other uh, forms of machine learning, they are pretty dense. They're pretty hard to pick apart and actually figure out um, how they actually work. And so um, we do a lot of curve fitting. Um, which isn't necessarily a very robust thing to do. What we want to do is emphasize valid causal representations. And that should be, so as an economist, for example, I'm um, used to doing this, you'll come up with a math mathematical model first. That'll make some very strong predictions based on theory. So it's a theory-driven thing, and then you're testing that against the data. And there's certain um, characteristics of the data you know from the theory can't possibly be true. like. Um, uh, a positive relationship between price and the amount of goods that you're selling, apart from maybe giving goods, um, but everything else, there should be an inverse relationship between those two things. So you've got really strong theory, and luckily for us, engineer, engineering and physics um, gives us pretty strong theory. So we should be integrating that into the, into the machine learning. Should be easy to use, but didn't have any sub points under that. It's just <laughs> self evident. <laughs> Um, efficient and um, one thing, you know, just making the setup, if you want to get up and running with machine learning, we need to minimise the setup cost. Um, seamless digital workflow, which I'm seeing positive signs out of Google and Azure and you know, Microsoft Azure and AWS and maybe a few others. And there's a lot of open source um, workflow tools that are now coming out as well. So I'm pretty hopeful that this one is upon us. Um, so we'll actually be able to do the full machine learning from collecting the data through to deploying um, the predictions where they need to be in one seamless workflow. That would be fantastic. But it also needs to be inexpensive because um, it costs a fortune to run lots of models on the cloud and constantly updating them. Um, no wonder the tech companies are doing well. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in taking forward, I've just sort of sketched out my uh, very preliminary thoughts on what the AI development roadmap could look like, and this is all about capability uh, for me. So I'm looking for particular capability milestones without necessarily setting a timetable. We should know um, what we're actually hunting for. So causal machine learning, I um, actually uh, did read a book by Jadad Pearl, 
uh, was awarded to me last year uh, by the Fed Machine Learning Group, so thank you very much. Um, that sent me on a, on a long 12 month journey What's understanding the book name? causal graphs. What is the book name? I've temporarily forgotten it. <laughs> the Book of Why. The Book of Why, that's it. It wasn't, it wasn't an obvious title, but it was very appropriately titled. Um, and of course, you learn about uh, causal diagrams. The interesting thing is a lot of the anecdotes, a lot of the uh, case studies that presented in that book were actually from the medical profession. And it struck me that the medical profession and, and utilities or any other asset um, intensive industry is actually pretty similar. So um, in the book, they're trying to predict whether smoking causes lung cancer and things which we take self-evident now, but uh, if you follow through the story in the book, it's interesting that it wasn't necessarily that obvious, especially <coughs> when there's a lot of automobiles in the 20th century that were belching out a lot of um, pollution. A lot of industrial development places like the UK that could have been the primary cause of lung cancer rather than smoke. Um, so it's, it's interesting. And uh, what you come down to is, because uh, Jedi Pearl also helped develop um, Bayesian networks or Bayesian belief networks and so he thought he'd struck it um, you know the causal um, inference machine learning back then in the 80s and he, he'd come to realize over the years that he hadn't and he's come back and said that we, causal graphs is what you need and so uh, these are now being built into algorithms machine learning hey welcome we definitely need this <laughs> so, so one thing I, I think that will really help speed this along is simulation models because as explained we're looking for anomalies. Anomalies by definition are rarely observed and so if you have a model of a data generating process which is this graph then you have a basis of generating lots of data it will be simulated but you can then create a, a large enough um, data set to actually train models on and you may actually be able to compare that to the actual observations and then identify further up the causal chain whether you're running into a risk of um, uh, some sort of safety uh, incident uh, about to happen. And that's the sort of prediction power that we're after. Um, so yeah, help spot the anomalies. And so also on the other side when we're looking at the false positives um, helping us build the back. I think that is a key part of that solution. So capability. Um, as I mentioned, I have nothing to do with IT and development in general, um, but I feel like I look after a data science team, <coughs> I've got some computer scientists, mathematicians and domain experts. That's my area. But the DevOps, we don't have a DevOps as far as I know. <laughs> um, it seems like this is a key element that we're missing. <laughs> we, we're get, getting increasingly distracted. I, I feel like I'm being pulled into the DevOps world. Um, I've got to learn things like C Sharp and Visual Studio and Azure Pipelines and all these other things. Well, all great to know and I probably will learn bits and pieces of it, but uh, ultimately um, we need this wrapped up in a way that actually makes it easy for data science and it can't be expensive because the data science thing is already expensive. So we, <laughs> so we either need to find a way to make the data science cheap or, or the mm -hmm. DevOps cheap. But I have a feeling the DevOps being cheap is <coughs> where it's going to end up. Sorry, you said the data science is expensive. Yeah. But isn't data science just like humans? Yeah, that's right. So like you've got lots of in, probably a lot of engineers not employed or underemployed. Yeah. So I mean, for them to transition to say data science. Providing them opportunities. Absolutely. That's why we're here. Um, so we've got oodles of opportunities and through the Perth Machine Learning Group we're hoping to tap mm. into that. Yeah, the engineers are too busy driving Uber. Yeah. <laughs> to even attend. Yeah, yeah. So, so that, that was some of the thing behind the Hackity thing that we did was um, we set up a hackathon and um, we shortlisted a, a couple of teams from that. Mm. And then we paid them to work with us for a few months. So I'm thinking it's like the data science expense is more like the cloud stuff. Yeah. And if you, you don't know what you want, if you don't know what you want or exactly know what it, it, the, the cloud stuff can do, then obviously you're going to be off the cost. And usually, yeah. I think the people, uh, my impression is that the managers or the people that make the decisions, um, they go for the cost, yes, um, but sometimes it might go better to go for a higher cost just to accomplish something. Yeah, and, like that. and when you're working in a large organisation, 
cost is obvious. You can see line items. You can see data science is costing how many millions? Um, <laughs> yeah. But can you, measure, can, you measure the, <laughs> can you measure the value of that? The value proposition is by way harder to measure, and that's something as an economist I spend a lot of time thinking about. Well, how do you actually measure value? How do you measure the benefits? And it's always the counterfactual, which is part of the reason why I was drawn to the causal diagrams of Judea Pearl, because it allows you to model the counterfactuals. So if we keep doing things the way we've traditionally done them, <coughs> we're going to see um, problems into the future as, as you get ageing networks. How do we intercept? What, what's the intervention we need to bring in? If we employ that sort of framework, um, presenting the value will be a hell of a lot easier, and then we'll be able to make those mature strategic decisions that you alluded to. So the cheapest, you know, using R, people tell me R is free. <laughs> I've used R, I can tell you it's not free. <laughs> Especially when something goes wrong. It costs a fortune. Um, but, you know, through Microsoft, their, their version of R, maybe, it'll be uh, better. But then you're paying someone yeah. to help you. And SAS, I probably mentioned SAS once already. I love SAS because it was, for what it does, statistical analysis is very efficient. Yes, there's a line item cost there. But if you compare that against the, a lot of the alternatives, you'll find that's actually a very good value proposition. You have things like your vegetation, where firefighting, for instance, could be an issue. And yeah. uh, so I, I was at a presentation the other day on the Defense Department and all the issues they're looking at. So really, it's one system that could be created for everybody. So yeah. it's not just something maybe Western power should be Absolutely. Really this requires collaboration from a, big, a lot seems of to be big time. Yeah. I was thinking yeah. to go beyond the artificial intelligence to acquired intelligence. Yeah. By using machine learning to commingle the um, the artificial intelligence and acquired intelligence of our past, yeah. but it's it's across the whole community. It seems yeah. that the Defense Department is looking at building things with the community now, so it might be a good. I've been working on this, so I'll chase you up later. Okay, cool. Um, Sorry, um, everyone here, do you mind? Do you want to have a question? I pass the mic around because we have some online audience as well. Okay. So as you can see from the dots at the top, we haven't got that much further to go before we get into the good stuff. <laughs> um, 3D digital twin models, that relates to the simulation thing and the physics thing. I think that's, that's a potentially useful vehicle. It seems to be still in the early days though. So I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts on that, you know, AI integrated with digital twin type models. Age of base models, which I've spent a fair amount of time over the years looking at this, it looks like an emerging field that can help us understand um, many dynamic assets where each asset is modelled as a separate agent and then you can have other agents like representations of people that interact with those as well. So in terms of pulling it together and creating that automated context, knowledge graph seems to be one of the developing areas that um, we can harness and a lot of the deep learning Algorithms seem to be built on graphs to start with. So we can actually pull together, and uh, I don't know if you can read everything on the, on the slide, but it says knowledge graphs, context for decisions, context for accuracy, context for efficiency, and context for explainability and power. And if you refer back to the core requirements, that actually ticks a lot of boxes. So I, I think this is um, promising. I've had a few interns looking at this uh, student teams from Curtin University <coughs> looking at this to sort of see, well, what are the core skills that we need to acquire to actually start on the knowledge graph journey. And Asian based models, I pulled out one particular um, approach, and it's a very simple AI based approach called goal oriented action planning. As the network um, chart indicates, there, you start with the the goal or the desired end state, which I stated right up front, was nobody gets hurt by assets or infrastructure. That's a very specific end state that we're after. And then you can explore many different pathways from where we are at the current state and how we get to that state. And this is a multi-dimensional problem. So uh, from what I've seen, and, and goal-oriented action planning was actually developed um, 
by Jeff Orkin, I think, at MIT for the um, computer game Fear. And uh, I never played that game. It came out around 2006 or something. But I understand that people, the anecdotes from people who played it is you have these NPCs or agents in the game that are actually hunting you. And it feels pretty scary because they're exhibiting some level of intelligence and an, and an ability to coordinate actions between them as well to get you. Um, and I've actually read some papers recently, but um, I think the DARPA sponsored papers looking at this for military applications. So if the US military are looking at this as a way to uh, make their operations more effective in the field, then maybe we should consider it as well. So as I say at the bottom, we want to step up from prediction to predictioneering, where we're actually engineering the future that we actually want, not the, the one we have to put up with. So that's pretty much it. We're now into the discussion session. So as I explained already, I'm definitely looking for your expert input. Um, do you agree with the uh, capability roadmap uh, that I've sketched out? Obviously, it's very high level, and it's like there's a bit from here and a bit from there and a bit from somewhere else. Should we? Are, are these all the crucial ingredients? Is there something else we're missing? Is there something that you think it could be done better in a different way? Uh, what is the fastest way to achieve the vision zero safety incident? So um, if we can just get to that end state as quickly as possible, and it can be through developing this roadmap further or something else, or it might be something devilishly simple that we can implement, if only. And um, what is missing from our capability roadmap? There might be a core requirement, you know, that we could just be blind to because we're being pulled in this tech world we only half understand. There may be something obvious, maybe on the, on the human intelligence side that we're ignoring. And uh, what complementary capabilities do we need to achieve this? So whenever you're pulling a team together and they need resources, they need to complement each other in terms of their perspectives and skill sets. So be very interested in fl fleshing that out too. So I feel like we need a DevOps team to sit alongside us and be integrated with us. We already are uh, integrated with the engineers and we, um, you know, it's a question of what skill mixes and what types of people do you need um, to pull this together? So that's it, and over to you for, uh, for some If you can stand there, I'll do one more. <laughs> I'm 50 years in the oil and gas industry, and what I've learned in the last 20 years is we went from the uh, acquired intelligence into artificial intelligence in the 90s that money and security became uh, an issue. Uh, and, and um, we didn't get transparency. Um, and now we, we have the complexity uh, of a mature economy sort of thing, and uh, we're working in competition rather than cooperation, and, and a lot of data is not available because the management wants security, mm. and uh, it's created um, gap right now and so it doesn't matter whether you're in your power industry or the oil and gas industry or, or even the defense industry um, we, we suddenly got to get cooperative yeah. and the web has brought that so I've been thinking of augmented intelligence which we never were able to have so you can't blame anybody for as we learn for not knowing the past and, and we, we, we focus on safety reliability innovation as a whole culture in the community. So th this would be, you really mapped it out very nicely as to the issues to address. And then um, we have a machine learning group here in Perth that's uh, quite astute. And uh, John Dale will probably lead this whole thing too. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, I, need you to. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a question. The cultural issue that we need to address, and, and wisdom and joy come from sacrificing to get it right. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I, I agree with those sentiments, and uh, I think um, the data pooling thing and pulling in different utilities, like in this state, just about every utility that matters is government owned. I think nice. The gas, the gas one is now in private hands, but I'm sure they'd be happy to cooperate anyway. But uh, I have um, reached out in the past and we've had a few ex Western Power people go to the Water Corporation and we're talking tentatively about how do we pull this together. A few years ago I went to a digital utilities conference in Melbourne and um, 
It was very clear from the presentations that in Queensland, because they typically have very small water utilities, they're actually working as an integrated larger organisation because of the digital technology that we've got to develop here. It's very expensive and for them it's, it could be um, too large a problem individually, so they're coming together. And I think if more of that were to happen, if there's ways we can facilitate that, I think all the better. And President Trump would like it if you help California manage their vegetation. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question, but it's not about Trump. Um, <laughs> thank God. <laughs> no comments about Trump. <laughs> um, so I've just, I've just been pondering on the, the question that you posed, right? Like, so what is missing? Um, and the question of, you know, do we think that... It, it, what it feels like it's almost like it's almost philosoph philosophical. Is technology going to have the, all of the answers to solving the problem of like zero harm? Mm. Um, and certainly, I agree that cooperation, further cooperation, is important. And from a technology perspective, I think it's because of uh, further access to data, as Wayne rightly pointed out. Mm. Um, but what is missing, I think, is the human factors. And so here's, I know it's been a long more a statement than a question. I'm going to get to my question, which is... Um, I it's a question for the whole group. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> which is, okay. So when we have incidents of people get hurt from infrastructure, um, those incidents are often unusual, yeah. right? And if we think about tools like causal inference, for instance, um, I have studied it a little bit, but I find that it seems to be... Even though Judea Pearl might believe it solves every problem, it, it feels to me like it needs large data sets to be able to be become quite useful. Mm. So I actually think my okay, I haven't actually answered the question. He's do you agree with me? Apologies, this is terrible. Just shut me up. Um, what, what do you think about like maybe it's the, the people who study human factors that is missing from your tech capability yeah. roadmap? Yeah, yeah. The people who study what? What motivates a person to put themselves in a situation that they might have a heightened risk of injury and then eventually injury happens? Mm. Um, so, I guess, what do you think about do you know like human factors or how would you incorporate the people who study human factors into, into your roadmap? Yeah, I, I, I've actually given that thing thought myself. So, so, the problem is that people they might do something, fiddle with the uh, electric. Um, stuff in the home, for example, run a faulty appliance when they probably know it's faulty like the toaster and they're going to run it anyway. And we've got these RCD devices that potentially intervene, but then we're relying on a technology solution to overcome somebody who should have known that they shouldn't have kept presenting that hazardous risk to themselves or their family. So, um, yes, yeah, psychology and cultural norms and things like that. Um, is really important. Um, so we actually have another crew that um, work alongside us, Customer Insights crew that try to help us with this. But uh, it's a long journey um, because there's so many, when you bring in the human dimensions and human behavior, it's, it's so complex. And there's ways of simplifying that in quantitative representations. And if you can capture the right essence of their behaviours and what potentially motivates that, those behaviours, we might be able to enhance the safety um, protection. So I've, I have a feeling that it's, uh, when you put in more barriers, and I don't know what the psychological term for this is, but you put in more safety barriers to protect people, that they end up taking more risk. Mm -hmm. And uh, I noticed that when I crossed the roads in Perth, where you've got the red man that tells you don't walk across the road, and you've got the green man that says, OK, um, how many people feel impatient about the green man appearing and just cross the road anyway? <laughs> yeah. And they, they probably can see that there's no cars coming along. But I almost got caught myself once crossing the road. The car was by far doing way too much speed, probably probably 80 kilometres an hour in the 40 zone, mm -hmm. and just came out of nowhere. The road looked clear, um, but it wasn't because. Um, they were way down the road, I didn't even see them. And then next minute, they nearly ran me over. Mm -hmm. so, um, so what was in my mind to say, well, just because I can't see a risk doesn't mean there isn't one. Mm -hmm. And what was in the person's mind driving that car that made them break 
so many laws to make that situation possible to start with. So, yeah, good question. <laughs> writing on the sidewalks as well. Sorry? They like writing down the sidewalks. Oh, yeah, they're maniacs, aren't they? they? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, they're, they're crazy, those guys. I, I write it myself, and I, I notice that. I know it's crazy pedestrians too, they don't think of <laughs> yeah, So I, I don't know if I answered your question adequately, but I think it's definitely a, a good discussion point. Apologies, sure. it was a pretty terrible question. <laughs> so any other, any other thoughts? Is there anything sort of jumping out? Has anyone tried things like dollar interaction planning and knowledge graphs and things like that? If you, there's one thing I found this group useful for when we're starting to dip our toe in the water it was convolutional neural networks that drew me into this crowd because I thought, feature engineering sucks! Yeah. <laughs> and convolutional neural networks were apparently a way to automatically create features. And since then, and it does to some extent with um, a lot of images and things, which is kind of really cool. Um, and the thing I've been thinking about recently is gener generative adversarial networks, which, because that's kind of an unsupervised learning thing, could be used to um, do more feature engineering. It could also be used to help simulate data and generate the anomalies that we're actually looking for. So what, what does look like, we use a causal graph, what, what looks like a, a true safety incident or a true hazard and build up a bit bigger data set around the games. What about the duck curve? The duck curve with Sol PD? You're talking about with the well, low trace in the grid, the duck curve is even without solar, but it's it's becoming amplified now. So it seems yeah. like we've got to get community cooperation with storage or something to cover the the high peaks, and you you have a forty percent or something solid supply, and the alternative yeah come in to fill in the gaps. Yeah, so there's a number of approaches. There's the engineering technical rules approach. It just don't let it happen. Voltage. Stability, we got a certain range of Maybe you just call an edger on your team. And yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think um, the other approach to this is economics. So harnessing a better market that can actually guarantee a balanced uh, system. So I think there are plenty of market reforms, but I better not rant on about that. <laughs> <in control. laughs> I've got a question. Uh, so a little bit of preamble, but. Uh, I've been listening to a lot about like people talk about like chalets, like on the measure of intelligence and all that type of jazz. They were talking about making these things intelligent and how you can really make these, it's just on the measure of intelligence. And one of the things he says is that it's kind of, if I understand, it's a bit like your aptitude or the rate you learn at like makes you smart. So you're good at something is to, to get something quickly or maybe generalize quickly to some tasks. And then when people talk about this kind of approach, a lot of people say your networks can really lossy because they're blank slates and you can make them better perhaps by finding a way to encode some sort of general understanding of things. Like people always go for like, hey, I want affine invariance or rotation rotational invariance, some type of fundamental understanding that we have that these machines don't have. And I guess I just wanted to ask is do you think there's any type of way of notion that this there that, that there is for like safety in that type of way. Is there like some sort of fundamental understanding we have of safety that's not really properly encapsulated in like how we build these models? Um very good question. Would you I have just, an answer? I, mean, <laughs> I, just, I just have a concept that is thank you, just a concept that is like safety invariance. So what operation can you perform to a system and be, math, if you were the math problem, right, mathematically guaranteed that after that operation was performed, your safety risk had not increased. And if the, the set of things that you could do to a system was large enough that you could do useful things, then you could, you could engineer systems with a level of safety. But I feel like that's such an abstract con. Anyway, I just want to say that's like a crazy idea. I love it. <laughs> yeah, so you've, you've definitely sparked this something there with at least John. <laughs> but I, I would say that, um, um, yeah, there is, there is definitely, because I, as a, on my journey through 
the machine learning AI thing, I'm delving into some pretty arcane, esoteric parts of computer science. And, you know, just a simple example, you're looking at uh, object-oriented programming. <clears throat> there are things called abstract classes and there's things called interfaces, and you can tell I've been doing C-sharp course. <laughs> but, but um, <clears throat> yeah, there, there is a way of framing these things that where you can get at potentially intelligence in a, you know, whether it's meta-learning, learning about models, you know, um, some of the stuff, um, is it called GPT-3 or something? Mm -hmm. Where they're t talking about generating code that can generate models. Um, it could be something like that, um, but ultimately we, um, we can harness. So I was hoping someone would say, yeah, GPT-3 is the answer to all your questions. <laughs> <laughs> so. signal of these tasks of like a conventional like loss functions or where we kind of you know build these type of frameworks like maybe these binary outcomes or how will we build them isn't smart enough do you think you know in the event of like what was unsupervised or contrastive learning do you think a machine-based approach could really you know just us not giving it the labels it learning the labels could potentially be better than what better a better notion of an idea of safety than we could well, it's, it's interesting because early on in some of the experiments, and in one in particular that I didn't put on the list, was we actually, um, when we started working with NASA engineers, they had this, um, and a reason that was done more for budget reasons than anything else, but they have like um, 10 different defect classes. And uh, they've salami sliced each class so that, because um, it's so cumbersome to um, redo the budget, so we'd put in this. Um, budget bid to the economic regulator to ask for all this money, which it will users have to pay for. The regulator says, No, you're not getting all of that, we're taking 20% off. So you've got to do, do with 80%. NASA engineers get done, so we can't fix all those assets. But they want to go down the list, and um, wherever that budget limit is, okay, the, this is the list that we're actually going to do. Um, so whether um, that actually helps. Um, you know, attacking this problem from different directions. So it could actually be the uh, the economic or the budget issue. We actually solve that problem and make that less cumbersome. But the other thing that occurred to me was um, when we tried to use convolutional neural networks to um, classify into each one of these categories, we couldn't do it because the data was basically came up with three classes. You know, if you sort of fiddle around with a categories and aggregate them until you get to this reliable distinction between it's really shit and you should do something whereas or it's really nothing to worry about, you know, even a binary class. So you you end up collapsing down. You're losing all the all the nuance that the asset engineers say they need. Um, to, and you get something pretty crude. But pretty crude step, and I was sort of thinking of it as, as in layers. Well we get to that first crude step and then maybe there's up some other form of algorithm or way of looking at the problem that actually gets this multi-layers back up to the human level um, where they can make those budget decisions really fast and make them accurate so that if they're having to triage the network, um, they actually have a, a really good basis to do that. So yeah, there's, this is a multi-faceted, multi-dimensional problem and uh, we definitely need creative thinking behind it. <laughs> so any other ideas? Thoughts? And you don't have to come up with them all tonight, you know, you can send me an email or something later. I guess one of the issues that I've got is that um, you know, this is a very wide ranging problem. Yeah. yeah. And you know, what we're talking about is looking at very large, we're looking at integrating a very large complex, which is really something which is pushing the boundaries of what we can do at the moment. You're looking at kind of causal knowledge graphs for prediction. Once again, like really pushing the boundaries of where people are with the technology at the moment. Mm. Um, pretty much everything that you are trying to deal with is is uh, is, is not in the mainstream. Mm. And you're looking to productionize it. Yeah, so exactly. Like, this is, <laughs> yeah, this is a multi-year um, problem to be working on. Yeah, and I don't think we'll get there in one step, not by any stretch. How do we break it down? Well, I kind of come up with these 
I mean, I think the, 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 the key problem in it is that um, there are architectures out there, there are approaches out there which you can um, which you can follow, and you know, hopefully they will, they will result in mm. something useful. But it's just getting your, your problems to dovetail to those solutions, mm. and that's like it's quite unintuitive, especially with things like graphical networks, how you actually dovetail your problem into that sort of solution. Mm. Um, and I think you know, most of the, the, the hard thinking work needs to go into, into trying to think about how you, how you bundle up things into a context which can be consumed by them. Yeah, yeah. And I was thinking, because I also did an online course uh, through EDX Harvard, course on causal diagrams, um, which is fantastic. And that was, again, had a lot of medical uh, cases to study. And it seems like if, if we're going to sort of piggyback off any particular field, it's probably the field of genetics. Um, mm -hmm. That's probably going to help us in the short term. They've had to confront some pretty major problems and, uh, you know, structure the way they do things and figure out whether they're being misled by the data or not. So what we probably going to do, sorry, John, we probably going to do um, work basically in the RL space because you you need something which is, you, you can't learn that from data, right? Yeah. The data's not going to give you those causal outcomes. Yeah. You, you need to either have... That's right, you've got to impose that on the data. Yeah, yeah. so you either yeah. have, have to have your physical model, which is like where you're going with simulation, or you have to use RL, which actually makes the intervention real world, yeah. and then you know, from that intervention learns about yeah, so I think um, reinforcement learning is probably going to be a big thing in, especially the electricity industry. We're going to be having lots of agents um, distributed across the network, acting, re-switching, um, activating protection devices, all sorts of things happening dynamically and autonomously. And there'll be some bigger agents that are uh, coordinating all of those through Power Ledger and others, I imagine, for economic as well as you know basic system stability um, reasons as well. So that's why my intuition sort of led me to agent-based modelling. I was thinking, well, simulations, if we can model a network like that in a digital environment before it ever gets deployed. Mm -hmm. that's so, it. so if you're going down that route, that, that's one of the areas you should be kind of looking at where you can, in, in as far as you can, you can come up with a model for anything like that. Mm -hmm. Because you're actually in you know, ODNets, you're actually encapsulating the model. The model, the mathematical model, is the model, mm. uh, and you're just trying to. So, so the, the mass of the model defines some sort of dynamic state, um, and with uh, ODEs, you're generally in some some kind of weird position in that dynamic state, and the model is just trying to learn where you are in that state, so mm. you can track forward to the mm. future. Yeah, so you might be touching on Markov chains. There is another thing I've been looking at with micro simulation models. Mm -hmm. Yes, but Markov chains won't, won't necessarily get you. Well, at least you can define these states. You can either be healthy or, or unwell. Yeah, or so dead. You, you, can, you, you, yeah. So you can learn states. <laughs> yeah. But you need to look at more sophisticated things. Right. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. I, I definitely feel like reinforcement learning is, is part of where we're going. Especially, I think initially we're going to um, be heavily focused on simulation models again because we're going to do a lot of long term scenario plans. And we put all the data into universities, and so the students are working on Yeah, I've, I've definitely reached out to universities and I've had a few teams working on various things, yeah. but uh, it, it is organisationally can be very time consuming to set that up. <laughs> yeah. And I think uh, in terms of my felt experience as Perth Machine Learning Group has been the avenue that's allowed me to do that in a, in a more efficient way. So, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like yeah, I Yes, we can hear. Yes, we can hear. <laughs> yeah, I did give a talk about ODE. So the idea of ODE network is that it is like infinite number of network. In this kind of mixture of uh, like neural network and uh, statistics, like uh, 
variation and entrance. Length and variable of the columns and so on. This is quite good idea. Okay, would you better send me something or put it on the Meetup website with some sort of background papers it's or something else? It's in our first machine learning group, GitHub. Uh, okay, I'll have a look. There, yeah, thank you very much. Get hard machine learning group. I, I didn't give a talk about it in two years. Uh, right. Sounds like it's time for another talk, people. Yeah, <laughs> but I think mean, you'll have to follow this one with yours so we can uh, delve into that a bit more detail. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how can I post it here? Uh, I can just drop it into Slack, you know, or drop it into the um, big channel. Cool, thank you very much. Cool. All right. Gee, okay. I don't know. I feel like my question got really old, and maybe it's maybe you, you want to end. Um, mostly, it was just to get another brain dump of of stream of, of consciousness. Uh, I really like causal inference, but I'm just really concerned about um, the the problems you're trying to solve. Because you, you know you talk a lot about using digital models and digital twins to try and predict things, mm. and to me I feel that causal inference is sort of an alternative to having a a physical model, um, and so I guess and, and I, I guess maybe I'm probably a little bit trapped thinking about those rare events that happen, um, you know that you're interested in predicting, but or you might interest what was the likelihood that I could have got injured like a counterfactual if I had have done this action mm. um, and I don't know I, I want to get your thoughts on from the because you've studied now causal inference a little bit mm. is it actually tractable for these types of um, you know low data problems you know do you think is there a way you could how, how could you apply causal inference to um, you know predicting whether someone's going to um, you know get injured you know through a, a faulty electrical um, you know part on the house or something you know like do you think, yeah, what do you think? Can you, can you apply it in that domain? How would you do that? Um, yeah, I, I think you can. It's gonna, obviously going to take a bit more study to really understand this. But one of the things that came out of the online course is there's a whole lot of um, intermediate variables. So the thing they emphasise in the causal learning, um, uh, causal diagram um, sort of approach is that you're trying to come up with a reduced representation of of the core of the problem. There's a whole lot of intermediate things that you don't need to model. And you know, so people can get distracted and end up creating these unwieldy large um, sort of networks of things that all, everything's related to everything else ultimately. But, um, and I kind of, with my training in economics, it is, definitely emphasizes that. Um, and I noticed that uh, causal Diagrams actually starting to creep into some of the economic papers now, which is really cool. So, um, yeah, a complex system like an economic system, you might be just analysing a particular asset or aspect or facet of that system, and you can boil it down to some very aggregated things. But in the process, you go through a, um, a series of mental gymnastics. Um, you, you become a lot more abstract. An example of that from economics is people talking about all these new technologies that are going to impact on the electricity network. Well, at the end of the day, it comes down to relative prices of how much it costs to get electricity from the grid as, as opposed to an alternative. And we actually, because it's been very well studied and demonstrated in the econometric literature that relative prices drive technology trends. So if you become relatively more expensive like the electricity grid has, people are going to find ways to work around it. It's just as simple as that. So you can condense a very complex um, theme where you, you know people get pulled in the trap of trying to predict, or is it going to be electric vehicles that are going to do, do this? Or is it going to be solar PV? Is it going to be the, the two together and all this other stuff? At the end of the day, you don't necessarily need to study all that detail. You just need to focus on the right fundamentals. And I think that's the thing with, maybe it's more of a human thing to guide humans in the way they analyze the data. And I think the thing that, emphasizing the most is like if you combine different variables and subset them in certain ways you can get completely misleading results 
So, and that, that's a big issue with uh, all the data work we do. It's crept in the machine learning thing because people tend to be less disciplined if they've got a more automated way of um, creating these models. They, they seem to uh, let the discipline drop about what variables should be in the model to start with. <coughs> and I definitely still feel, feel very strongly that we should be driving for parsimony. You know, we want a simple model, but not too simple. And um, so that's just, you know, my personal bias, but it seems to work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, is this a, like I've been listening to you, sorry, sorry. I've been listening to you talk and we used to have these conversations quite a lot. Yeah. Is this just a really complex way of talking about how you write conceptual modeling, right? Exactly, that's exactly okay. what it is. So yeah, so it's, a, it's a, so I'm sort of getting a sense of and, and I'm a behavior behaviorist, so behavior specialist. So how do you combine these things to get them the most, uh, a model that works, but also test your your assumptions as you go? I yeah. find that I rely more, and I'm just saying if this is part, you need to add this as part of your capability roadmap, yeah. is I find that you use the, um, the maths to make sure that you haven't missed something in your conceptual model. And then you build it, and then it tells you if there's something wrong. Yeah. Um, rather than relying first on the maths, I guess maybe I'm summing up some of the things that yeah. you know, putting it in my yeah. Own language. Yeah, it's def definitely data can present scenarios that you wouldn't have thought of uh, for sure. And or, then, or disprove things yeah. that you maybe were relying on that aren't actually true. Yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, so I think um, yeah, getting that right conceptual model, the one that has some sort of validity and understanding the context in which it is a valid model. Because when you come up with a simpler representation, then there's potentially some scenarios in which it's no longer valid. But well, then that adds to you the problem that you're talking about, yeah. about cost, right? Yeah. Because once you're, you're built and testing your conceptual model, you're not spending money in places you don't need to spend it. Well, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so. Wholeheartedly agree with you. So I'm, I'm summing up the problem. Yeah, and, and, yeah. Yeah, and I think yeah, it's just a matter of um, finding the best way to express that in the, in the work that we're doing. So, so in, yeah. in your capability roadmap, do you have that ability to build the conception models, which I think is very collaborative? Yep. And definitely. it's like these qualitative skills yes. <laughs> that you need to evolve yes, exactly. a conversation um, and. That's kind of, if, if I were looking at your capability roadmap, I think that's perhaps what I would. Cool, thank you. I'll definitely make sure that's in the next presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe I would like to put a spotlight um, on John. Um, now John actually in a position to hire a, a group of AI engineer. Maybe he can share some experience of how to cross the capability roadmap with Grant. <laughs> <laughs> I was not prepared for this question. <laughs> what? Wait, actually, I'm not sure what the question. My experience on building up your team. Yeah. Oh. What sort of capabilities you're looking for, I guess, and does that have any relevance to this particular problem? Okay. Um, just need a moment to think about that. Um, I guess I think better on my feet. I guess shall I stand up? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Gee, capabilities are hard. <laughs> yeah, look, so actually to be honest, your, your point around um, the conceptual model and yeah, understanding how you think these systems work is probably very important. That's probably the hardest thing I think as a tech, um, as a tech person to do. Um, so yeah, so I guess in evolving, um, evolving that 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 is that is hard. And, and one of my first people I brought onto my team didn't have any ability in coding at all, couldn't code anything, but they knew how people worked because I, I knew I needed somebody who could do that. Um, yeah. So and, and then it's it's just about just building a good team of diverse people who think differently. And um, but a skilled in, in in the domain that the team that I was running is going to be. This is kind of a really awkward question I was ready for. Is does that answer the question? Is that what yes. I'm supposed to? Yeah, I, I think yeah. The recognition that you don't want to just um, focus narrowly on a particular skill set. Um, 
you got to think about broader, um, softer, so-called softer yeah. skills, the human interaction skills, and encourage that. So you don't want everyone on an extreme spectrum yeah. where they can't relate to each other because that's going to get in the way of actually coming up with a solution. Yeah. And then people will be a bit different as well because otherwise you get um, kind of monoculture happening. Mm -hmm. um, but you know what, here I am sitting up. Yes, in fact, I don't know if this is a, the right time to do it, but yes, if somebody wants to come and join my team, you're welcome to. <laughs> um, you know, fairly small team at the moment of um, AI and machine learning people working for a mining company down the street um, looking at solving important problems there. But yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Pretty cool. So we could could stray into sort of you know philosophies around team size and how do you coordinate multi teams and things like that. I really feel like I've just been um, <laughs> you know yeah okay um what really you want me to answer that question? Well just you know throw out some random thoughts random. and you know, like I, I, personally I have a strong orientation I think small teams are better because people get lost in the crowd and they feel like I I don't matter. Mm. in a big group, if you boil it down into small groups, and they're highly interdependent. If one of them isn't pulling their weight, for yeah. whatever reason, um, the others will come in and try and help, but they also, there's also that pressure to, for the person to come up, you know, lift the <coughs> performance. If, but you also get that um, close, yeah, that yeah. close understanding over time about you know where people's strengths and weaknesses are, and, and each of the team members, if they're very collaborative, they'll pick up on this, and hopefully will ensure that they're, what they bring into the table, they'll adapt and evolve to bring something that the others don't have, but makes the the team stronger. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I guess yeah. So my random thoughts on that, I kind of agree with you. Um, I'm looking, hoping not to get any bigger than eight. I feel like that's my max size for the, the team that I want to, to be building. Um, although it, it's kind of funny, so we, I've had a small team for a long time, um, and you do get the opposite side where you have like effectively enough projects for one project per person, and that could be problematic too because um, you you start you start getting silos forming in your own team, and so you really want the ideal world is where there's quite a few different people in a collaborative environment all sort of working towards the same um, one thing. Um, but yes, there's a problem when you get too big that people can just kind of hide in the group. And that's not good, not because you, you know, hiding is bad, it's just not good because hiding like that means like no growth, right? So that mm. individual is sort of from their, their career path kind of stagnating in, in their thing. And so, you know, you want to, at least in my view, you want to like, Trying to find that balance. I mean, the balance I'm always looking for, and I don't like always achieve it. But what I, what I think perfect looks like for a team that I run, and, and for, for hopefully the people who, who work work for me, is a working on problems that have clear value. Where in a simple one-liner, you can understand how does this help the company you're working for. Yeah. That are but that are problems that are that also have a bit of a, a future, like a really cool vision. Like, you know, like if we did this first thing and then that thing, then this really cool thing might happen. Um, but, and also problems that are close to your, like what you are good at, but aren't actually what you're good at, that are like a little bit of a stretch so that you you grow. And I don't know, just, you know, and, and hopefully as well, and I try to, <laughs> not that I'm always good at this either, but try to like, you know, Trying to like get people to um, get people to stand up and to, to stand out in what they're doing, um, you know, and, and to try to encourage them to be the one presenting. Um, okay, now I, now I really am just random. This is like <laughs> <laughs> um, 